This is the first in a series of videos that I'm going to produce replying to criticisms that have been made of my postings on the Labour Theory of Value. The, I'm dealing with these because I think the criticism, particularly by Bryce Edwards, are honestly inspired and the criticisms they make are symptomatic of certain general misconceptions that are more widespread about um, Marxist economics or s about science. I mean, what kinds of misconceptions am I talking about? I'm talking about misconceptions about the nature of science and modelling. I'm talking about misconceptions about what socially necessary labour is. And I'm also may later touch on misconceptions about what was actually novel in the economic work of Karl Marx. Because I like to limit my videos to being fairly short, I'm only going to cover the first of these points in this video. Edwards accused me of empiricism, and this is not the first time people have said this. I think the reason I'm accused of empiricism is because, unlike many academic Marxists, I try to support as many claims as possible that I make in my writings with empirical evidence. But I think the very fact that empiricism can be thrown about as a term of abuse is itself a sign of an unhealthy attitude towards science. When you think of it, would anyone seriously start accusing a biologist or a chemist of being an empiricist? Clearly not, because there is no biology or chemistry outside of empirical research. You have theories, but every chemist and every biologist has to do empirical research. Now, part of the problem, I think, is that most people talking about this don't have a clear conception of what a materialist concept of modelling the world is. Science constructs models of the world in order to understand it. And a model allows us to make predictions about what will happen in circumstances other than those we're currently observing. That's why we want models. That's why they're useful. The only substantive Marxist philosophical work that I know of on this topic is by Badia, and it's one of his earliest works, The Concept of Model, which he wrote in 1968. It focuses rather narrowly on the concept of model in mathematics, but it's still a good starting point for people who want to understand the topic. I go somewhat beyond that uh, in, in my materialist treatment of it, and I'm going to quickly go through some of the concepts that are relevant to modelling and why this relates to some of the criticisms that Edwards has made of my work. If we approach modelling from a materialist standpoint, any scientific model is itself a physical system, and it's a physical system for predicting how another part of the world, another part of reality, will behave. People tend to think of models in a very abstract and conceptual sense. I think that's wrong. You should look at them in a very concrete material sense. I'm going to give some historical examples and some criteria for the goodness of models before talking about modelling and economics. And I tend to approach all these things in a rather computational or mathematical way because of my background. The basic modelling process involves a model you're building or have constructed, the real world, you have some initial observations, you feed them into the model, this makes predictions, and you are then able to compare these with other observations you take later to see whether the model correctly predicts what's going on in the world. That's clearly what weather forecasters do every day. They build a model of the weather, a computerized model of the weather, and over the years they've honed these models so that they can give highly accurate predictions several days ahead of what the weather's going to be. 
people tend to think of models as being ideas, but I think that's a mistake. Models are always physical. People think of Newton as contemplating the world and contemplating the orbits of the planets. Uh, and if we time forward to NASA sending a probe to Mercury, NASA actually has to build a computer model of the path of that probe before it sends it to Mercury. Now, are these one the same thing? Is this a physical model, whereas this is an ideal model of the planets Newton had? I don't think so. Were Newton's models entirely theoretical, or did they have a physical existence? If you look at the Principia, it's full of geometrical diagrams. If you look at Blake's picture of Newton, he shows Newton drawing with a compass and protractor. The actual models that the early astronomers, astronomical theorists produced were models that were to be computed, that were to be computed with geometry by um, drawing lines and curves. If you go right back to the time of the Greek astronomers, you can see that they actually built physical models. In 1900, a group of sponge divers um, sheltering from a storm off the island of Antikera went diving and they spotted an ancient shipwreck along with lots of uh, bronze and marble statuary, which was hauled up and taken to museums. Later, when they're diving, they, appear, they discovered what appeared to be gear wheels embedded in the rock. When these were recovered, they were found to be parts of a complicated mechanism and were initially assumed to be a clock. Starting in the 1950s, then going on through the 70s, Price established that it wasn't a clock, but some form of calendric computer. And using modern X-ray tomography, We've, people have been able to make a very accurate model of how this machine worked and so accurate that people have been able to make replicas of it. Here is one built by Tanya van Vark. She builds lovely models of old computational machines and it's worth going and having a look at her website. Here you can see that the machine originally had one dial at the front, two dials at the back, by turning a handle, you could get predictions of where the sun and moon were going to be in the sky years ahead, and you could get predictions of the dates of eclipses. So here you see what a scientific model is. It's a microcosm that simulates or emulates the macrocosm. Nowadays we can do most of that with digital computers. We don't tend to build physical models, but the digital computer is itself a physical model. If you think of the world climate model, it is physically embodied in, a, in large computers with disks and memory which store the data. What are the key principles that you have to follow when doing materialist modeling? Well, if you're thinking about a scientific model, you want to be able to generate testable predictions. Models which don't make any testable predictions are useless. And this is one of the points I always emphasize when studying the theory of value. What predictions does a theory of value make? Are these testable or are they just waffle? Next point is elegance and simplicity. You should go for the simplest model that will reproduce the phenomena. Beyond that, there's no point throwing in complexity. The problem with throwing in complexity is that it puts in more parameters which by tuning them enable you to fit any set of circumstances and therefore reduce the reliability of any predictions you make. Another point is, is subsampling. The model is not the same thing as the real world. It's a, a smaller model, a subsampled model. But what you want to be true is that Propositions that are true in the model are also true in the system being modelled, but not vice versa. 
The, the, the system being modelled is bigger and more complex and will have details that are missed out in the model. Edward, Edward's criticised me on in Facebook for having said that monetary quantities represent labour quantities. He says this holds a danger of essentialism. Instead, he says, I should have followed Marx and said that labour determines prices. In part, this is just a quibble over words. But in part, it is also a failure to understand models and the way models work. Here are two representations of the Queen Elizabeth II. What you're seeing are video pictures one on the left, one on the right. But the picture on the left is a picture of a plastic model of the ship. The picture on the right is a picture of the actual ship sailing down the Clyde. Now, both of these are material. The plastic model is material, the ship is material. You've got a material model and another real system. But the model represents the system. It represents the real system. It's not a matter of essences, it's a matter of relationship between physical beings or physical systems. Now the same conceptual relationship of representation exists between monetary relations and the distribution of social labour and between prices and values. One is a model for the other. Monetary relations are physical. Money is physical pieces of paper, physical coins. The distribution of social labour time is something that physically takes place. So, the representation is not something ideal, but it's a relationship between two physical systems. We have monetary relations and prices on the one hand, and the distribution of social labour and values on the other. And one models the other. One represents the other. One may ask, why is a price model necessary? Now, the basic reason for this is that any society must regulate the social division of labour. Marx mentions that this was done directly in what he calls the ingenious communism of the Incas. Or you can see it was done directly in people's communes in China. Marx also says that the regulation of the division of labour was done by tradition and inheritance in the Asiatic mode of production in India. Or it can be done by working with a monetary model as happens in the capitalist economy. Here the model is something that is actually in use. The monetary model is in day-to-day -day use. The, the modelling that was done by the Incas was also physical. They used quipu, knotted strings, to model the allocation of labour and resources. So the modelling process again was physical, but they were not mediating it via money. They were mediating it via a system of representation of, of people and resources physically in terms of these knotted strings. For this to work, prices must have sufficient accuracy to have a, a reasonably good relationship to the underlying labour resources which are being allocated. Relations between prices have to approximate relations between allocated labour. But this doesn't rule out the possibility of systematic distortions and, and minor errors. If you consider the pictures of the ships that I, I showed earlier, the model of the ship gets the fact that it only has one funnel correct. It has a minor distortion in that it paints the funnel white whereas the actual ship had a red funnel. That doesn't matter so much. What matters more is if there are systematic distortions generated by a system of representation. Here I'm showing a picture of the moon. Such a picture reduces the spherical moon to a flat disk. This introduces systematic distortions. 
because of foreshortening the ratio between the distance AB and AC will be smaller in the real world than it appears on the photo. That's because we underestimate the distance from A to C because C is close to the limb of the moon where distances are foreshortened and underestimated. The closer I went to the limb the, the more serious the error would be. You can see the same kind of error in maps but this representation of the moon that you take with a photograph still tells us something useful. It tells us that the distance from A to B is a lot shorter than the distance from A to C, which is still a useful indicator for us. Let's look at the Mercatus map. This again has the problem of reducing a sphere spherical world to a two-dimensional model. And what it's done is that it has systematically overrepresented the areas of the polar continents. So the closer to the pole they are, the bigger they appear in area. So Antarctica is grossly inflated in area compared to Africa. But despite those kinds of systematic errors, Mercator's projections maps were still useful. You could use them to navigate. Suppose you wanted to sail from Africa here to New York. You can draw a line between the um, port in Africa that you're going to sail from and New York and see what angle relative to north that line has. That then tells you the compass course you have to follow. If you follow that compass course accurately you'll arrive in New York. So although the maps have a systematic distortion, they're still useful. And for centuries people have used Mercator projections maps to navigate around the world. So the model is useful even if it does contain errors. There are analogous distortions introduced by the monetary system. The Mercator map overestimates areas at the poles. Monetary calculation overestimates the real social cost of plant and equipment relative to living labour. That's because plant and equipment are paid at their full value whereas living labour is only paid at a fraction of its value because the value of labour power is less than the value created by, va by labour. And the errors get worse as the wage share of national income falls. This distortion holds back technical progress but it's not so bad that it makes capitalist calculation completely irrational. The capitalist system can still function with this distorted system of calculation. However, socialism needs realistic calculation in terms of labour time in order to overcome these distortions which become more and more pressing on the development of the forces of production as capitalism progresses. And that, in my analysis, this is one of the major reasons why the forces of production are developing so slowly in the capitalist world at the moment. Now, I gave the example of the Mercatus projection. There's another map projection called the Peters projection, which correctly shows the areas of the different continents. As you can see, when you see a look at a Peters projection map, you realize just how big Africa really is compared to the other continents. Arno Peters, who invented this map, was also a strong advocate of the idea that future society should do all its economic calculation using labor time, not money. So this issue of representation, this issue of models, this issue of maps, they're all tied up. And the fact that Marx didn't say represents doesn't matter. He conveyed the same idea. And the monetary system does represent labour. And it does represent it in a distorted way, but with just enough accuracy for society to continue to operate via some degree of cybernetic relations through the market. But we need something better.